time to pass the audio off to our host, Susan Barger. Go ahead, Susan. Hi, everyone. Um, this is the last session of uh, Planning Your Reorg project. And um, so I'm pleased to see you all. Uh, I'm sorry if you had trouble finding in, um, but that's been corrected, so people should be coming in now. Um, so this is the remaining schedule. This is the last webinar. If you're planning to get a badge, you need to have completed all of the webinars and all of the assignments by June 15th. And then the following week, I'll issue the badges. Um, when I checked last night, it looked like there are a lot of people that have, have done, uh, if you were up to date today, you would have completed 10 out of 12 items. It looked like there were a lot of people that were still at 9. So um, I may send out a message in the next few days if people seem to be stuck there and let you know, because I'm assuming that those people are hoping for a badge, too. So um, you can look for an email from me. If you have additional uh, questions about uh, course mechanics or other questions, um, contact me. This is my email address. And if you have questions about uh, course content, put them in the discussion box um, on the education website. And um, to keep informed about Connecting to Collections Care, join our Connecting to Collections Care webinar. And uh, you can find the instructions on our website. And you can join us on social media or follow us on Twitter. And these are what we have coming up. We have a course coming up um, in July and early August on making the most of your assessments. So if you've had assessments and you didn't quite know what to do with them when they were done, this is the course for you. And it will include different types of assess assessments, using assessments to raise money, uh, using assessments to do planning, um, that kind of stuff. And then in July, we're going to have a free webinar on HVAC systems. And the ad for that should be posted fairly soon. So look for that on our website. And um, for everyone who's having problems with the flooding, uh, wind, fires, this is the 24-hour hotline for the National Heritage Responders uh, in the US. So uh, feel free to use that. And I think that's all for my slides. I'm going to turn this over to Simon. Uh, so Simon Lambert from CCI, you're going to take over. Hi, everyone. I'm really happy to have you all here for the final webinar. I hope you didn't miss us too much. It's been about a month since our last webinar, so I know it's been hard for you. So uh, without further ado, uh, we'll begin today. Uh, the last webinar is about implementing a reorg project. Uh, and we're, it's really part two of this uh, ANGELS project uh, case study that we began um, talking about at the last session, where we had um, envisioned the project a certain way and then now we have implemented it a couple of years a couple of years a couple of weeks ago and we're here today to talk to you about uh, how it went and what went uh, differently than expected and what went what were some of the challenges that we faced um, so today with me I have Lisa Goldberg uh, who will be uh, describing the work that we did and uh, Possibly Susan uh, from the New London Maritime Society, who will be joining us a bit later. Um, if not, well, she uh, I thought it was important to mention her since it was such a uh, she was such a huge part of this um, of this uh, effort to reorganize her storage. Um, so, uh, just a quick reminder that the course objectives, um, which um, of this uh, webinar and the final assignment. You will have developed a basic reorg plan to improve collections access and care in one of your storage rooms. And some of you who have, uh, are up to date in their assignments have this plan already. So congratulations on all those who are up to date on their assignments. Um, the objective for this session, as I was mentioning, was that we'll review the implementation of the reorg project uh, at the Custom House Maritime Museum. And we'll look at uh, the various steps that we went through, the decisions that we made, 
and look at some of the challenges and lessons learned from this experience. So hopefully seeing yet another uh, implementation of a reorg project will give you some ideas for your own projects. Um, a quick reminder that all the material that we're using and then talking about in this webinar series uh, was developed by ECROM with the support of UNESCO and was adapted for distance learning through a collaboration with CCI, the Canadian Conservation Institute. All the materials are available for free for download online on the ECROM website and the address is here below. And the material is available in English, French, Spanish, and Portuguese for the moment. So um, let's begin with the, uh, the uh, ANGELS project. So as we mentioned last time, this was um, a pre-conference one-day uh, project that we implemented thanks to all the volunteers who showed up to, um, to uh, lend a hand uh, to Susan and her, her team to reorganize their storage area before the AIC conference uh, in Connecticut, USA. So just a quick reminder where we were at when we started. Um, I showed this in the last uh, webinar, or per perhaps Rachel did. Um, so this is kind of a starting situation where most of our four components were in the orange, and we're doing a little bit better with furniture and small equipment, although we did uh, make a lot of changes in that area as well. So we're kind of in the area here mostly where you know it says, you need a reorg project. And so that is what we did. We did a reorg project. So this is um, our storage area um, <coughs> that is uh, our starting situation. So this is the plan number four, the occupation plan. So that is the before reorg, how it looked like before. Um, and just a quick reminder of um, some shots from inside the storage area so you can have an idea of what we're, we were facing when we started. <coughs> Okay, so now I'm just going to go through quickly, um, as a reminder, what the different um, mini projects were in this project. So th those are like the little uh, chunks of projects that we that we had to deal with. So we had some framed works, uh, and we did not know at the time when we started how many we had. Um, we knew that most of them were under one meter or three feet, so we didn't have any extremely large frames. But then we ended up finding a few of those, so, as one does when one starts to empty a whole storage area. You find things that you didn't expect. So here, uh, mostly we had you know smaller to medium-sized frames. Uh, we had some flags. Um, some of them we intended on rolling, and some of them we intended on boxing. And um, the maps. Um, apologize for this picture, but that was the picture we had uh, to, to begin with. So this is, uh, we had a lot of uh, rolled maps. And in the end, the quantity of maps ended up being pretty much around 30. So that was great that we anticipated the correct number of maps to be rolled. Um, uniforms, we knew that we had some small ones that needed to be boxed and some large ones that needed to be boxed as well. Um, and then paintings. Uh, we had some large rolled paintings uh, that you can see here on the top of that shelving unit. Um, long thing here, um, which is actually a mural that is folded, uh, that is rolled. Um, and then we had some small objects that could be carried in two hands, uh, and then some smaller, ob even smaller objects that could be that were um, could be handled by, by one hand, so much smaller items. And we didn't know the quantity either going into this project. Um, so the priorities we identified for this project were to first, we needed to relocate or discard all the non-collection items to make room for the collection. Uh, we needed to create uh, storage systems that were better adapted to the collection's actual needs. Uh, because we had a lot of storage units in that space, but a lot of them uh, did not have uh, did not have um, high enough shelves to allow us to fit objects inside. So we had to find another solution for a lot of objects. 
And we wanted uh, to make sure that there would be no objects directly on the floor at the end of this reorg. And then we also um, wanted to create a new location system at the end of the project. So those were our four priorities. Um, this is uh, a floor plan of the space that we were working in. So here I highlighted where Susan's office is. So the office of the curator director is there. Um, and this is our storage area right there in front of her office. And we identified these two uh, other rooms, which are very similar. It's kind of a very um, symmetrical uh, layout here. So the two other rooms that are of similar size, um, one was designated a rolling station. So everything that was going to be rolled was going to be happening in this room. And everything that was going to be boxed was going to be happening in the room there on the lower right side. Um, and then in the basement, here I'm showing you the exact same floor plan because I don't have a floor plan of the basement, but imagine the, the basement being exactly the same layout as the, uh, as the other level that I showed you. So this, is, this level that I'm showing you now is actually below the storage area. Um, so in the very, in the sub-basement, as they call it, uh, we have designated a room here for non-collection items that were props, so things that were used for exhibitions um, and things like that. Um, and then we have another room here, which uh, was also non-collection. We designated to store non-collection, but we were mostly storing uh, display cases <clears throat> and also some items that were uh, going to be sold in a kind of a, a tag sale, uh, so like a, a sale to uh, raise money um, for, the, for the museum. Some of the items that were um, donated to be sold by the museum uh, were not part of the collection, but they were actually inside the storage area. And so we needed to find a space for those objects so that they weren't confused with the collection. Uh, so we decided that those could be you know, to find a small corner for those things in the same room uh, as the non-collection items here, uh, the display cases. So this whole basement here was for non-collections. And then we also have, we also had a lot of empty frames, which were not part of the collection, uh, but there were there's a significant amount of these empty frames, and so we needed to find a place for them that was outside of storage. And so um, um, a storage unit that was empty was placed right outside here uh, in the corridor, and we just put all of the empty um, picture frames in there so that they were not in the collection storage area anymore. So again, this is the before. And this is what we wanted to do initially. This was our proposal. Now I'm going to show you how that changed a little bit and why. So first thing is that we had, we received actually uh, one unit, um, missing one unit in our shipment of units. So <laughs> we were expecting to have eight, and we only had seven. But that was wasn't so much of a problem, and I'll show you why. Um, so we, that was our starting point was we are missing a unit. <laughs> but let's talk about the units a bit later. Uh, the first thing that we noticed when we actually spent more time in the space, because I have to remind everyone that uh, the only person that had actually seen the space, apart from Susan, who works there, was Rachel was part of the team, and Rachel was there for only a few hours. So it was a very quick visit of the whole facility. And, uh, and she took many photos, but sometimes there's always uh, details uh, when you're doing a site visit like that with a storage area that's so full uh, that you don't see. Um, and so one thing that we did not anticipate was that um, this little nook that we had in the floor plan here was actually not usable for anything. So that was a, just a, a full wall. So we were not able to put anything into that nook. So it was just a straight wall. Um, and here, in the middle, there was a radiator. So we were actually not able to uh, put anything in front of it or uh, you know, 
So we had to separate all the, the units that we thought we could group together. We actually had to keep them separate. So that was a big, bit of a difference. Um, we ended up keeping one of these units, these cupboards, which I'll show you what they look like if you, if you don't remember. Um, so we moved that one there. And then we had actually seven of these units, but they were longer than we thought or longer than we had thought of in our, our, our first proposal. So we didn't really feel like we could add another uh, another unit here because we would have been so close to the to the wall that it would have been really impractical and actually not uh, functional at all. And so we only felt like we could act, we could uh, include six. So we we only used six of them. And we had one of these cupboards here that uh, kept from we thought we were going to be removing it from the layout, but in the end, uh, these units were really useful for storing trays with really small objects inside. And we had a lot more of those trays than we anticipated. And so instead of ending up uh, with trays on, on shelves, we said, well, why don't we keep another one of these cupboards so that we can put more of the trays inside? So that's one thing that we realized when we arrived on site and spent a little more time looking inside the units. We didn't end up using that one that was there, so I removed that. But we found some uh, units in the sub-basement here uh, along this wall that we could repurpose for storing frames. And as you'll recall, we had a lot of frames that were stored uh, in these units before, and they were stored horizontally, and we had a lot more frames to store. So we needed to find a lot of um, a lot more uh, storage for frames. Here, once I show you what these look like. So these are those units in the back here, uh, which we ended up, final layout, we flipped them 90 degrees so that we would have slots that were vertical instead of horizontal. And so that allowed us to store uh, frames more safely. Instead of stacking them on top of each other, we can actually slide them in. Uh, but then we did end up keeping one uh, as it is. So we did not flip this one because there were some frames that were quite fragile. And we felt that we, if we just put we could use um, we could use some of those compartments uh, horizontally, uh, and it would be safer for some objects. So we ended up keeping one as is, and we flipped this one 90 degrees so that we would have vertical storage for those. Here, we these are these slotted units that we found in the in the basement, and Susan had a lot of larger frames that uh, were currently on exhibition that she would be taking down soon. And if we hadn't done this reorg, she would have had no place to put them. So at the end of our project, these were still empty. But um, Susan now has a lot of space to store those frames that are of different sizes. So she now has a storage uh, location for those frames, which is great. And these here uh, are those cabinets um, that were um, used for those trays with smaller objects. So when you open those doors of the cabinet, there's a um, there's a very um, very uh, small shelves in there that you can slide trays into, uh, much like these units here at the top. So when you open it, it looks like that a little bit inside. So you can slide some trays in there. Um, the other thing here uh, is uh, at the end of these six units, we had some leftover space at the end here. And so we decided that that could be used to store some of the long, flat items um, that are typically found on shelves, but that end up using a lot of shelf height and wasting a lot of space. So since we couldn't add another unit here because there wasn't enough space for circulation, we still used this surface, which was available, to hang a piece of coroplast that was secured in place with uh, zip ties. <clears throat> and um, uh, objects that were safe enough to be hung 
uh, were uh, attached with cotton twill tape. But um, Lisa will probably describe this a little bit more in detail after. So this was our um, sticky notes exercise that I showed at the last webinar. So this is what we started as, a, as an initial uh, brainstorming activity. This is kind of what we had envisioned would take place during the one-day workshop. But when we arrived on location, we quickly realized that there was a lot more uh, non-collection than we thought in that space. So it would be, we felt that it would be very difficult for us to accomplish all of that in one day if all of the non-collections remained in the space. And so we did have to do a little bit more work on the day before, which was a Sunday, uh, in order to uh, make sure that the group could start working right away on the day of the reorg. So for instance, we had to identify all the collections and non-collections and unknowns. We did that on Sunday uh, because if we had to, to um, if, if the groups all had to go through Susan to clarify those questions, then that would have probably slowed down the process a little bit. So we did all of that work beforehand. We did designate an area for rubbish uh, because uh, that was a very easy thing to do. So we just planned that ahead of time. We set up a space for non-collections in the sunny basement, which I showed you on the floor plan. So we did kind of identify where things would go so that it would be much easier to get started and to, to get the ball, ball rolling and to, to hit the ground running, as they say. So, um, and then we also designated an area for all the unknown objects. Uh, we set up uh, temporary storage locations for all of the different types of objects. Like we knew where we were going to bring the flags. We knew where we were going to bring uh, the large pieces of furniture. We knew where we were going to bring uh, the maps. And so that was all decided beforehand so that we could, once we assigned a group to those tasks, then they would know what to do right away. Uh, we also removed what we could of the rubbish that was found in storage. There wasn't that much rubbish. Uh, there were mostly a lot of um, uh, display cases, uh, items like props, uh, as I mentioned, some items that were to be sold in um, a tag sale. And so those items ha were just removed so that there were no questions um, when we started. You know, is this collection or non-collection? Most of those questions were answered the day before. Um, and then we did relocate what we could of the non-collection to the semi-basement. Um, there were large pieces, very large uh, display cases and uh, furniture pieces that had to be removed with professional movers because it would not have been safe for us to do so. So those movers actually came the morning when the group was walking in, when the group of volunteers arrived uh, for the day uh, to start working. Um, the movers also arrived at the same time. So while we were doing introductions, and uh, getting a sense of what we would be doing throughout the day. While we were talking, the movers were removing all the, <laughs> the furniture, the large furniture, the display cases, and everything, and moving that into the basement. Um, and then we also, uh, yeah, that involved also relocating the unwanted units to the semi-basement. That's kind of what we had when we started. So we did all of those tasks on the Sunday. Um, so that when we uh, were ready to start working on the Monday, um, everyone could work more smoothly. So instead of doing a uh, reorg chart, as you have done, the ones who have done assignments the number, uh, for week number five, uh, we decided to do a checklist. And the reason why I thought this would, be, this would work better, um, it's just simpler um, visually. And since we were only working for one day, um, I think we only had four groups working simultaneously, so it's very easy for you know group blue to go to their sheet and group um, red to go to their sheet and look at what they had to do. Um, it's a choice. Uh, so at some point, if in your own project, um, you may switch back and forth between a project chart and these checklists. The checklists are really easy, simple, uh, easy to understand for people. The progress chart, what's nice about it is, is you can visually see the project uh, moving forward and advancing. Uh, but sometimes um, in past projects, um, we have started with a project chart and realized that we, are, we did not estimate 
um, when tasks would finish and others would end and things like that. So we ended up putting the, the project chart aside and going to a, a checklist. So, and, and other times we use the project chart from beginning to end. So it really depends. And you'll, you'll get a sense when you're in the, in the heat of the action if it's best to abandon the project chart and to move to a simpler checklist. So that's what we chose for that one day. Um, and this is what the situation in storage at the end of that Sunday preparation day. So we still had a lot of things in storage, obviously. Uh, this is one of these large display cases that was very heavy that needed to be removed by the movers. Uh, as you can see, we started tagging the objects uh, that were part of the collection so that it was clear everything that was in the room and that had a post-it or was, was clearly collection. And then we also had some um, post-it notes for the movers to tell them where to move things. So we have this one that says, remove to sub-basement. So they knew when they were there in the morning, somebody could just tell them, okay, everything with a post-it note that <laughs> says move to basement, then that's what you need to take out and move to the basement. Um, and then this is just outside storage. So this is when we had started removing some of the uh, display cases and boxes and all the things that would be then moved to the basement. So we just felt like we needed to create some space for people to be able to work. And so that's why we, we did remove all of those non-collection items before. Um, just to go back to our initial list of what could go wrong, um, this is what we had anticipated could go wrong, uh, but actually didn't. <laughs> so we, we weren't sure at the time if we would be receiving the shelving units, uh, and we did, so that's great. Um, insufficient packing rehousing materials was not a problem. Um, whenever we um, used uh, packing materials for projects that we didn't anticipate using those packing materials, we just adapted by using other things for, for, other, for other objects. So we just, we felt like uh, at some point we were thinking that we would use corrugated plastic for one thing, and we didn't end up using it for that. We used it for something else, and so we just used something else for that other thing. So we just uh, adapted along the way. Um, some tasks uh, take longer than expected. Um, that really didn't happen. Um, because we made sure to monitor as we were going along. Um, one of the tasks was to um, roll the maps. And that, uh, based on the solution that that team decided they were going to use for the maps, we saw that it could take a bit longer than if they had simply been uh, placed on the shelf. And so we just reacted to that by adding many more people to that team. So that team initially had two people in it, but since the solution was a little bit more elaborate and was going to take a little bit more time, we put six people or eight people on that team so that um, we just adapted, uh, adjusted the resources to each team based on how uh, we, we saw it was going. Um, fewer people than expected, that, that did not happen. We actually had a few more people than we expected, so that's great. Someone brought their husband with them, so we had a great team. Uh, everyone was uh, really great to work with, and uh, no, everyone contributed uh, really positively to the project. Um, running out of swing space, we did not run out. We really used every single square meter, square foot of that basement. Uh, and we did luckily have an outdoor tent that we used, and that was uh, very useful mostly for building the shelving units because we would not have been able to build them anywhere if we did not have this tent. And it was raining that day, so it was very useful to have a covered area uh, where we could work and assemble the units outside. Um, other problems, uh, well, we thought that we didn't anticipate, well, as I mentioned, we had many more non-collection items than we expected. And so we did um, have movers come in the morning before uh, the workshop started. And we had planned this ahead of time, like we knew that that might happen. And so Susan uh, knew that there may be a need for people to move large things. And so we were able to react quite quickly. Um, 
there were a few more objects in certain categories than we anticipated. And Lisa, I think, is going to talk about that a little bit with the textiles, uh, which always seem to appear out of nowhere. Um, and we, she, Lisa also mentioned that we had no plan for pest-related issues. So uh, maybe she's going to talk a little bit more about that. So if we found objects that were actively infested, um, we hadn't really thought about that in this particular case. So um, if that happened, then Lisa can maybe talk about what they did to remediate that problem. Um, in terms of bottlenecks, um, we, this is what we thought could be a bottleneck. So uh, I think it's not necessarily designating an area for the unknowns, but it's how many unknowns we have is to identify what the unknowns are, like things that you're not sure if it's collection or non-collection. Um, and that did take a long, a long time. And that's why we did it the day before. So um, if we had waited uh, for the workshop to do this, it would have slowed down the progress incredibly. So we, we just decided to do that before everyone got there. Um, and so you just kind of adapt like that. It's very normal for this to happen. Um, because you, once you spend more time in the space, you start seeing more things that you perhaps didn't see before. Um, assembling the storage units we thought could take a long time. And what we did to make sure that that wasn't a bottleneck is we assigned about six or eight people to that team so that uh, we had a lot of people building storage units at the same time. So they were all, uh, by the time all the collections were ready to go back into storage, all the units had been assembled. Um, and then um, adapting the units for the framed works uh, ended up not being really an issue at all. And so we were really happy that that, would, that went very smoothly. Now I'm going to hand it over to Lisa, and she can talk a little bit more about the process. Hello. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Goldberg. I'm a private objects conservator. And um, I'm the editor for AIC News and also for the Stash C website. And I've been involved in the process um, from the beginning, but um, this is my first chance to talk to all of you. So I'm going to describe the process. Um, on Sunday, we all gathered. And as um, Simon aptly went over, we reviewed um, the scope of work and determined whether the mini projects were still viable and set up for the on-site day. That included um, setting up work areas, unpacking cartons of donated supplies, and assigning um, various workspaces to various projects. Um, as you saw, we identified collection and non-collection items. Simon, I just want to point out that Simon is standing in front of a shelving unit where we had been told that all of the items in that shelving unit, all of the textiles, were non-collection. But when they were actually unpacked, a number of flags were uncovered that were actually collection items. I think there were 40 small flags, and we had to sort of fold them into the work process. And um, again, we tagged various areas to, so that volunteers would know what was meant to go where. Um, the hallway, which Simon didn't mention, was set up as a temporary storage area and also an area for tools. Um, Rachel and I brought any number of tools, labeled them, and shared them for the project. But we had basically two um, community tool areas, and we had to share tools. Some of, some, of, some of them went upstairs, some of them went downstairs, and there were various times during the project where there was a lot of running up and down the steps to figure out um, to retrieve tools. We set up one of the shelving units on the first day. Um, as a place to store extra things and also as a place um, to start putting collections as they were removed out of the room. Um, and the sitting room area was set up for, um, for boxing textiles initially, but we actually ended up using it for the flat textiles so that we could lay them out. And you'll see we had two uh, Nilfus vacuum cleaners with variable speed control um, that Rachel and I brought and used. And various people used them during the day. We also had a, a big roll of batting, um, a roll of acid-free tissue, a carton of coroplast, and a set number of um, corrugated cardboard boxes that we had designated for, um, for folded textiles and for flat textiles. 
the tent outside was set up to set up the um, the shelving units, and as Simon said, we um, we also used it. It was raining that day, but we were able to use it. I also want you to note the two doors to the basement area. That is the access for, for large-scale furniture that was moved out of the storeroom, down the hallway, outside, and back down through the stairway. I have a slide of that later. Um, we started with orienting all of our volunteers. Um, this included um, a, an introduction to the space by Simon, an introduction to the process. And um, and people divided into four teams, and we used this um, this flow chart to direct our activities, or checklist actually, to direct our activities. And you can see that some of them are already checked off because these slides were taken um, halfway through the process. And there you can see a team member checking off part of the list. Um, as the furniture was moved out by um, three guys who showed up actually earlier than everybody else and um, but were working through the morning while we were there and as I said they moved things out of these double doors uh, down the hallway from from the storeroom out of these double doors and then back in through the basement so it was a little tight moving a little involved and and people just worked around each other um, the team working working in the storeroom um, started unpacking things and moving them out. Anything that was tagged obviously went on to shelving units in the hallway. Um, I want you to notice the long rolled mural on top of the murals. There were two of them on top of the shelving unit. And on top of that is a um, linen-backed flag, linen-backed, not flag, linen-backed paper map. Um, that had to receive special treatment later on, and it took a fair amount of time to, to rehouse. So these are just some more pictures of emptying out the storeroom and um, hand carrying objects out. Um, we moved the steel metal shelving units out and down into the basement. As things were moved out, um, team members vacuum cleaned the units that remained in place. Um, on all interior surfaces, um, and this is the room with all with the team, and actually a few other teams um, in the storage space as, as it was emptied out. Um, team members working in the room, once the objects were out, um, moved the furniture to the locations that Simon um, showed in his plan, and um, the units that were stored on their side were lined on the bottom with ethafoam. We, we had a roll of ethafoam donated by Rachel Ehrenstein and her company. Um, we had initially thought that we would use coroplast. I think we did. Actually, we used coroplast on the bottoms of these, and then we didn't have enough coroplast, so any frame, any slots that had more than one frame in them were lined with um, ethafoam sheeting to, you know, so that the frames could be leaned against each other back to back or or front to front. Um, front to front prevent damage. Um, let me also go back and mention that we moved the furniture up onto the top of a storage unit in that little niche that um, Simon had thought we couldn't move, use, but we ended up being able to put one of the larger um, storage units on its side into that niche. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, Objects were, were moved out of the storeroom and were put onto uh, temporary shelving, which was basically the shelving that we assembled. And I should also note that the, we thought we were getting um, steel solid shelving, and we ended up, this was a donation from Home Depot, we ended up with these metro shelves. So one of the things that we had to do when we were changing course was use some of the coroplast that we had been given um, to make liners for these shelves. Um, but I wanted to mention here that as things came out of the, the storeroom, we sorted them by size and by group. So you'll notice all of the um, banker's boxes are on one shelving unit. And on the top of that shelving unit, there are smaller boxes that are all grouped together. These things were not together by size necessarily in the storeroom, but Sorting them by size as they came out of the storeroom helped us when we were ready to repopulate 
um, the storeroom. And we used every available space. This is actually the bathroom in the basement. And we ended up, or washroom, and we ended up storing the um, framed items in there temporarily. And again, we sorted them by size as much as we could as we went along. Um, outside, there was a team assembling the um, shelving units in the rain and the cold. And they later used um, cut, cut the liners for the shelves. And meanwhile, inside in the, um, in the flat storage or rolled storage room, um, the rolled, the, sorry, the, the room that was meant for boxing um, garments that became a flat, store, flat textile room, um, the team that was dealing with textiles had some discussions to sort of figure out what their um, strategy would be for using the set number of boxes that we had um, to store to sort and store and rehouse um, the ever-growing number of textiles that were uncovered as the process went along. So um, this, the large box behind the person in a black vest, who's me, um, was full of flat textile slags that we had designated for rolling and for um, flat storage, depending on the sizes we were given in advance. Um, the box actually contained more textiles than we thought and um, was a perfect fit for a number of pretty fragile textiles that seemed to be grouped by type. So we opted to keep those in the box, to reuse that box, which freed up some of the boxes um, that we had previously thought we were going to use for, for those textiles um, for, for us to be able to use for other purposes. Meanwhile, back in the room, the room was cleaned, the storage furniture was set up. And um, I want you to notice in this photo that the we used one of the slotted units, which we had set aside for fragile frames, also for some of the um, trade items that um, we didn't have any other place for in the cabinets with doors. And we decided to put the murals back in the same place, the rolled murals back into the same place that they were in. Um, they were rolled on fairly heavy sonotubes. Sonotubes are basically used for concrete, um, and they're not acid-free. Um, we were concerned about the fragility of the paint layer, and we didn't really feel that we had the time um, to appropriately care for these textiles if we were to unroll them. So you'll see in later slides, we took them outside, we um, wrapped them in cotton muslin, and we tied them closed. And the, um, the special storage container that was made for that large um, linen-lined map sits on top of it. Um, I also want to note that we used the corner, the back corner in the corner of the fly, um, to store the large box that you saw in the in the previous slide, the large textile box. Here's just a picture of the furniture stored on top of um, the upturned unit that was that's meant for larger framed items that Susan will take off display. And um, we also ended up creatively using the space under the furniture to store other items. And you'll see that as we get further along. Once the room was clean, we started setting up our storage units um, and populating them as we moved them in. So we chose to put the textiles in boxes on tops of the units, the banker bottom boxes on the bottoms, and we used the shelves of varying heights for objects of different sizes. Because we did not have um, steel shelving units as we had hoped that we could um, screw, screw together, we ended up using zip ties to make sure that they remained attached to one another. And here is that large textile being moved out. We set up bumpers um, to prevent it from um, rolling once it was on a, a long table. And it, it was rolled in, in fabric, as you saw. And then it was put back, carefully put back on top of the storage unit. You'll notice that there's a gap between the two units. Um, we didn't feel that there was anything we could really do about that. There's a radiator down there. And that's what we did for now. <laughs> um, back to textiles, we decided to layer the textiles 
in that oversized box with tissue paper in between them and to roll the ones that would not fit in the box flat. So here is a description, uh, I, I mean a, a, a depiction of, of discussions about rolling the textiles. We also, um, we also photographed each one as we layered them into the box to make sure that Susan has a, a record of the textiles that are in that box and she'll be able to use it later on. Um, on the right, you'll notice that we tried to, we were putting, initially thought we would put the rolled textiles into boxes with bumpers under the ends of the rolls. Uh, we did not anticipate nor find a good solution for how to hang or store our rolled textiles. Towards the end of the project, we ended, we realized we had more clothing items than we had initially anticipated. And the textiles were taken out of that box. And we, we made a very quick sort of roll support out of two wooden boxes and carved epifoam, which, um, and that unit basically sits under one of the pieces of furniture in the storeroom. And here we are rolling the textiles with tissue paper. Um, as Simon mentioned, we had not made a plan for what to do about active um, pest problems. And one of the flags we came across that was folded, this flag in particular, had fairly fresh um, pest debris on it. It was soft. It was sticky. Um, uh -huh. We chose to vacuum it. And we sealed it in plastic. And Rachel um, Ehrenstein took it back with her to put in the freezer. Um, small institutions here in the US often don't have um, solutions for, for what to do in the in the, the situation of a, a pest emergency. I this could be one if, if it's active. We we don't know when when it was active. We're assuming um, we didn't see anything live, but it certainly seemed recent enough that um, we thought it better to, to take care at the moment. There were other objects that had problems um, and were set aside or received um, sort of on-the-spot treatment. On the right is a metal that is obviously chewed, and there are rat droppings in the corner of the box, as you can see. The object was vacuum cleaned and um, had a special little tray made. We made trays for, I'd say, 10 objects out of scraps of Blueboard that someone brought to the project with simple hot glue gun um, secured corners. And um, those objects were then put inside of trays and put in, into the units. In the room where the, um, where the textiles, the, the garments were housed, um, garments were padded out as appropriate with um, polyester batting and tissue paper. Sometimes we used. Um, Tyvek sheeting, we had a roll of Tyvek sheeting, and because we only had one roll of tissue paper, we switched back and forth between what was used. Um, items that were stacked on top of each other, like folded t-shirts, were separated with, um, with Tyvek or tissue paper that was folded around them, sort of like a phase box, but, but made out of that material. Um, some of the items had mold on them, and um, that was vacuum cleaned, and this is just a demonstration of some of the care that these uniforms had. Um, I will also say that in addition to the extra um, flags, signal flags that we found in the box, at the very end of the day, um, we were handed some hangers with fairly heavy uniforms that we had for we knew we were supposed to get, but we had forgotten to account for them. And those uniforms were um, padded out and quickly stored into textile boxes, we, we basically made room for them. Other items, such as hats, were padded with internal supports. And um, the four volunteers who worked on the, the garments and the, and the textiles did a, uh, an incredible job of sort of moving through the items that kept appearing on their plates or on their tables. Upstairs in the galleries, we set up a space for dealing with the um, the rolled paper um, maps and plans, as Simon said. And um, each of these was mounted on a sheet of coroplast or um, foam core, and each was wrapped in tissue paper. The foam, the the 
item was then um, tied to the foam core or the the um, coroplast with um, twill tape or just cotton strips, um, and the the platform, the foam core or the ethophone or the coroplast rather, served basically to protect the edges and prevent crushing. Um, and then they were placed on the shelves in the storage room in those very narrow slots that you saw in the upper parts of the unit. Um, this project was time consuming and as Simon said we assigned more people to it as we went along. Um, the, the large linen and paper map had no support so a decision was made to unroll it, provide a foam support for it, re-roll it, and then to make a box for it. And the volunteers who worked on this project, um, basically because the map was longer than our longest sheet of coroplast, had to cut and um, paste pieces of coroplast together to create a triangular enclosure that was closed with um, twill tape. Downstairs in the sub-basement, other volunteers were cleaning out um, shelving units and wiping down frames so that everything could be placed back in its, in its new location, clean and secure. And outside, um, this, we had a whole series of long, skinny objects that took up a lot of space on shelves, as Simon said. And we didn't have enough space on the object, on the storage solution board that we that they came up with. So this volunteer, Greg, came up with a basically an egg carton um, or an egg crate solution that he made out of coroplast um, using a wooden repurposing a wooden box that was lined with polyethylene sheeting. Um, it was really ingenious. It worked quite well. It fit into a corner of the storeroom perfectly um, and created a very nice high density storage area, a safe storage for some fairly fragile objects like um, umbrellas and canes with decorative tops. And meanwhile, uh, also under the tent, and um, the other, volu other volunteers on the same team were um, creating this basically tie board that would hang vertically in the storeroom. Um, as you can see, not all the furniture fit on, the, um, on top of the storage unit, and those that didn't were given at the foam blocks as they were piled on top of each other. And these are images of our final um, product looking down the two rows. And you can see that no object is on the floor. Everything is neatly um, on, on the shelves, neat and clean. Um, and every possible inch of the storeroom is used. And I forgot to put the after in, but the middle photo is the after slide, the before, after. And Simon and Rachel um, posing to show you how how pleased we all were that we finished our objective. We completely reorganized the storeroom in one day. Um, so here's a before and here's an after, just to give you a sense of the dramatic change we made in the space. Another before and after. Another before and after. Um, and again, you can see that the larger the textile boxes are, are on tops of the units. We use the next shelf down for the maps, which are fairly lightweight and don't need much um, much height. Um, the middle area was used for objects of m multiple heights, and the bottom shelves were used for the banker boxes. And um, Simon wanted to show you the... Um, I can jump in if you want, Lisa. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, so this is the uh, before uh, the reorg. This is what the self-evaluation looked like. And this is the improvement that we were able to make in the management. And this is based on an evaluation done by Susan herself of before and after. This is the improvement to the building and space component and the uh, improvement to the collection. So there's a small improvement there, but larger in the other areas and the improvement in the furniture and small equipment area. So this gives you an idea of what, how you can use the self-evaluation to show the improvement before and after a project, which is useful for reporting and for you know, justifying investing those resources into that project. Um, oops. So yeah, so this is, again, before and after. 
and Lisa. Sure. Um, this is us at the end of the day. Happy faces, happy tired faces. Um, a list of all the volunteers, um, including the three guys from the moving company who helped us. And we'd also like to thank all of our sponsors and partners. We received an incredible outpouring of um, of of um, donations in in the way of um, packing materials, storage materials, cash donations, and supplies um, from the long list ahead. And in addition, not up there, Susan um, provided us with lunches, incredible lunches, camaraderie, and um, and a, a really wonderful sense of, of accomplishment. So, Susan? <laughs> and there we are having fun. <laughs> Oops, so let's go back to the slide here. Yep. yep. Okay. Yes, okay, so um, at this time I'd just like to ask, I know that some people who are in this photo um, are listening online, and so I'd like to uh, to ask those people to uh, use the chat box just to tell us uh, one thing that they take away from this experience, one one positive thing, or one you know one of the challenges that that they faced, or uh, something that they learned, uh, just to share with the other uh, participants in this course uh, your personal uh, views on the course. So while while those people are writing their comments in the in the, in the chat box. Um, I was wondering if our host for the workshop, Susan uh, Tamulevich, would, would uh, share her uh, personal experience uh, and uh, what she found more more challenging about the about the experience or uh, beneficial. Uh, just her kind of uh, overall impressions of the of the one day reorg. Susan. All right, well, Susan, I think, is logged into the system, but not on the phone. So in the meantime, we have a comment from Barbara, who was there. And she says, one thing I learned, don't give up. It can be done with great, op <laughs> can be done with great organizing skill. So that's great. And I'd like to jump in and answer the question about who were our volunteers. Um, okay. Volunteers were people who signed up for the um, for the Angels Project through AIC, and I think almost half of the group um, is taking this course as well. Um, we had some people who are collections care professionals. We had conservators. We had textile conservators, um, objects conservators, paintings conservators, pre-programmed people, a wide, wide range. We're typing things. We'll just wait until those comments come in. Um, in answer to Maggie's question about not enough swing space, I will say that when we first arrived at the site, um, Rachel, Simon, and I were worried about what we would use as swing space, um, but we adapted the hallway to use for storage of objects as they came out of the storeroom. We used the kitchen as one of our textile um, workspaces, and we basically cleared out any boxes, chairs, um, kitchen supplies, and we set up for a workspace in the gallery. The museum was not open during the day when we worked. And so some uh, other participants in, in for other projects have um, closed off a gallery uh, to to act as a temporary swing space when they didn't have uh, a room that they could use. Um, some people didn't have that, and so what they did is they cleared a small area within their storage that they designated as a swing space, and they would move from space to space uh, and and move their their swing space around as things filled up and so they had a kind of a floating swing space so there was always a little square where things could go into and as those things then went, went somewhere else then that swing space would move in the space so there's various options if you don't have a conference room or something like that that you can use as a temporary swing space um, we do have a comment from Rachel um, I had a few takeaways in addition to all the important ones mentioned by Lisa and Simon one people really want to help and will feel great about donating 
<clears throat> their time as long as you keep them working effectively. And two, you can never have too many utility knives or tape measures, and Barbara says, or scissors. <laughs> I guess some people were looking for the scissors. Um, uh, someone said, uh, give me great hope. I thought my stuff was a mess. I'm not alone. OK, so this is someone else who wasn't part of the workshop. Elizabeth, who was one of our co-coordinators, who you see in the green sweater on the kind of left side of the image with the stripes. Um, we had some synergy with uh, the map wrapping project. And that was so very useful. You think it should be done one way, and then useful comments and input improved the process, streamlined it, and allowed it allowed us to cross the finish line. So it's always, as uh, Elizabeth says, important to be flexible and to adapt, because uh, everyone has uh, something to contribute. Um, and Susan at the Custom House, who is writing in her comment here, says, there were so many good ideas. I'm, I find I'm ripping up other areas for the museum <laughs> to apply your tactics. <laughs> That's great. As a result, things are still pretty hectic here, perhaps even more so than when you left. But I am confident I can apply your techniques to redo the kitchen, storage shelves, et cetera. So that's great. So this reorg goes beyond collection storage and can be used for other non collection <laughs> areas as well. So that's great to see. Um, Excellent. People look excited to start their own reorg projects, which is kind of the purpose here. So we're, we're happy that uh, if you're, you're, you're feeling motivated by this example. Um, I just want to um, end the session now by going through, um, you know, we've done so many different reorg projects. This was the first one uh, that we did in the United States. Um, and um, But there were so many others in Canada and around the world. Uh, in Belgium, in, uh, in Nigeria, in China, in so many countries. And over the past six or seven years or eight years, uh, there have been things that uh, are common to all those projects and things that kind of constantly emerge as lessons learned. And so we kind of uh, listed those, some, some of these um, that, uh, that, that for us uh, seem to emerge from a lot of these projects. So um, Marjolaine from um, Belgium is on the phone with us today. And so um, she wanted to share one uh, with regards to reorg uh, as a way of strengthening the museum's uh, team. OK. Uh, thank you, Simon. Do you? I, I suppose uh, everybody can hear me now. I dialed in. I was following uh, the whole presentation. I want to congratulate everybody for the beautiful work you did in only one day. Um, it's uh, giving me a lot of strength, too. And it's uh, to connect it to your first lesson learned. Um, also, after teaching a national and international workshop uh, on the REORC method, and after coaching some Belgian museums in their REORC projects, uh, I am still super excited to continue to do this because um, the, the, the team building and the team spirit you, you create by working together and um, I don't know if, if everybody hears me. Yeah. yeah, you hear me, Simon? Everybody here? OK. I continue. Um, the, this is one of the main reasons why I am so excited about the method, because at the same moment you are reorganizing, you're working with collections, but you are strengthening uh, the, the team spirit. You are creating teams uh, in your museum, in your, uh, in your own surrounding, and uh, you are uh, strengthening capacity building in your museum, but also uh, networking and getting to know each other and learning from each other. So you you get out of the isolation and you get out of the idea that you will uh, not man, uh, manage to, to do a work like that. So this is why the first lesson, uh, I, uh, I am happy to, to add a little uh, information from my side. This team building is uh, it's, it's also it's also a whole it's also the whole first phase of the method is dedicated to this uh, to this part. It's the creation of a team, and so uh, it's reflected in the whole in the whole method too. Why it is so important uh, to strengthen your team and to work on that. That was 
my I could not agree partner. more. <laughs> Thank you, Mazlou. <laughs> um, uh, so our second lesson learned uh, that we found, um, and this actually comes to us from one of our participants, is when you, you are in doubt, double the time. So people find it very challenging sometimes to estimate how long a project will take, uh, estimating how long the project uh, will take to implement. And so um, what they what kind of comes up again and again in the feedback that we get from the people who have implemented these projects is whatever we thought it was going to take, we should have doubled that because there's always unknowns when you're doing a reorg project. And in fact, if you looked at the case study that we did uh, that we just showed you, um, we ended up working two days instead of one. So it's pretty much um, it's pretty much true. So there was a lot of uh, things that, that you, you kind of discover things along the way and, and that you can't necessarily anticipate. And so it's always good to double the time. But then again, uh, it's, uh, whatever you think will be doubled, and that has to be doubled. So <laughs> anyways, the point is um, there are a lot of unknowns. And so you should um, allow for some buffer space in your timeline uh, to accommodate uh, possible delays due to unknown uh, objects or issues surfacing. Um, so that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, one thing that has come up already today is the need to be flexible and adapt as needed because there are, uh, like we said, many unknowns and um, different perspectives. And people bring their experience, and uh, they've, they perhaps they perhaps have tried certain things before, and so they know that things uh, might work better in a different way. So it's important to remain open and be flexible and adapt the plan. Uh, you know, you design this really nice chart, and then it falls apart, and that's fine. Uh, and that's why then we move to a checklist, which is more easy. It's, it's easier and more flexible, and sometimes um, you're able, as in the case where you see here on the image, we use this. Uh, project chart all the way to the end of the project. And this is a three-day project. But here, um, after uh, the first day, we moved to a checklist because the chart did, we found didn't uh, meet our needs anymore. So that's how, what we mean when we say be flexible and adapt. Um, you know, this is a contentious issue. A lot of people uh, uh, feel that they should be doing the inventory before reorg. We really found, though, that it's it's much easier to do the inventory um, once you have done your physical reorg. Uh, it is difficult to imagine in the in the case study that we just saw, um, you know, doing the inventory in that space uh, when there are so many non-collection items and so many um, quote unquote uh, mystery items that we don't know if they are collection or non-collection. It's very, very difficult in those conditions to do an inventory. Of course, if you're starting from a situation where all those things are more, much more clear and uh, you know that everything in there is collection and the collection is accessible, well, either you don't need a reorg or <laughs> you might be able to do some inventory beforehand. But um, it's usually, uh, in most cases, and I'd say 90% of cases, the inventory is best done afterwards. Um, swing space is mandatory. So even if you don't have uh, a conference room or a training room or uh, a boardroom or something that you can use temporarily, as I mentioned and, and Lisa mentioned as well, you can use spaces. Uh, you know, we, we were using all the hallways as swing space. One thing to keep in mind is when you're emptying um, a storage area where things are on shelves, you need to have as much surface as you had. And so in this case on the left is an example of the railway museum in, in Belgrade in Serbia where they had a huge gymnasium type space where they can lay all of the collection flat on the floor and create a grid to mirror the storage location. That's really an exceptional case. And that happens in you know 1 or 2% of the cases. You don't usually have this luxury. And so you do have to set up some temporary shelving units uh, such as uh, what we did at the Custom House, where you can um, 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 store things temporarily on there before you bring them back into storage. And uh, what we did at the Custom House, and in this case here, which is at the Colchester Historium in Halifax, Nova Scotia, is that we used the actual shelving units that were going to be going back into storage as temporary shelving. And so while when you are bringing things back into storage, you need to you always have to empty a unit in order to bring a unit inside. So there's that kind of coordination that needs to happen 
when things are being brought back in. But it worked fairly well uh, for our team, um, and so it, it's t totally uh, doable. Uh, lesson six, uh, which you've heard many times during this uh, webinar series, is to think in terms of categories, not types. So we're thinking about big stuff, small stuff, heavy stuff, flat stuff, rolled stuff, not necessarily in terms of the object types. So we need to think about volumes and um, uh, length and storage requirements rather than object types. And that helps us plan uh, the storage solutions that will ultimately uh, work in really that case. Um, and lesson seven is, when in doubt, mm -hmm. fill the floor space. So we did mention that a few times where um, sometimes people, um, or for, for various reasons, it's not practical to measure, uh, to do a very detailed space analysis. Um, and so the best thing, if you only have one room to play with, uh, basically you have to work within that room. And uh, so there aren't many things you can do. And so the best thing you can do, as we did in our case, is to fill the floor space as much as possible with units, um, ma making sure that it's, uh, uh, it's, still, um, it's still safe to move around with objects throughout the space. So that's the one thing that needs to be uh, respected is the, the safety uh, of the collection and of, of the people. And so we need to provide adequate uh, circulation space. But usually it's about 50% of the floor space that you can fill with units if they are fixed units. Um, so um, lesson six, expect a never-ending supply of textiles. Because if you have, if your institution um, has a mixed collection with some textiles in it, uh, it it's absolutely, I guarantee you, you will find a box of textiles or two or three or a bag with textiles in a corner that you did not see before. So um, as, as, hap as you know, the situation that we faced at, at the Custom House, we uh, ended up with more textiles than we thought. And so um, this always happens. And so it's good to have an extra supply of boxes or rolls just in case there are more textiles than anticipated. Then lesson nine, uh, don't let museum standards limit your creativity. Uh, but the only thing is that we want to make sure that it's safe for the collection. So we're using a lot of non-standard, uh, non-museum uh, conservation grade uh, type materials. But we want to make sure that the interaction between these materials and the collection uh, does not cause uh, deterioration or any uh, problems for the collection. And so it's OK to use materials as long as they're safe. And so there are resources in Reorg where you can go through the different types of plastics or wood-based products or paper products that have um, problems uh, when they interact with collections. And so it's, you, know, you can use things as long as uh, that's the whole point of your you're making improvements on how the situation was in the first place. And so um, you are not aiming for perfection. We're aiming for uh, better access to collections and uh, optimized preventive conservation. Uh, but it's not ever perfection. <laughs> and so even the people in the museums and the institutions who say uh, who you would think have ideal and perfect storage always have something to say about their, their storage solutions. So there's no, there's no such thing as perfection. But what we can do is try to make sure that our collections are safe. Um, and then as a final word, I'd like to leave, um, I'd like to uh, pass it over to Marjo, who has a few other lessons learned that she'd like to share with us. OK. Um, thank you, Simon. I, uh, I just want to say as a last, a last tip or last lesson, for all those people who are uh, who did the webinar or followed the webinar and who are now keen on starting to uh, work on uh, on their own storage, um, I would propose you to start small uh, from the very start. Try to uh, to start small to gain uh, confidence and don't see it too big because uh, it's a, it's a, it's something you have to learn. Where are the bottlenecks and where are the problems? And as soon as you, as it's clear which storage or part of the storage of your own storage you are going to reorganize, I would uh, propose to double check your plan. 
or to even redo the plan, the plan one and two, you know, the plan one of the, the building and the, with the fixtures, and to double check it and uh, measure and remeasure, because most of the time the plans that you get from the architects or some plans that you have uh, in your possession are not uh, completely right, and so sometimes you can lose some time uh, with this. But uh, start small, and um, I hope I don't have the last word. It should be Simon, because you did the most of the work. And uh, again, congratulations, and good luck to everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, Marzo. Um, so um, this is, brings us to the end of this, uh, this course. Um, I want to thank everyone for their participation. I want to thank uh, FAIC's Connecting to Collections Care Program. Uh, I want to thank the Royal Institute for Cultural Heritage, uh, Kikirpa, one of our partners, uh, ICROM, STASH, the Science Museum of Minnesota, and um, the course would like to thank CCI as well <laughs> for uh, developing this course uh, along with all our partners. Um, I really wish you all a um, uh, really successful reorg project, and I hope that you will share your results on the uh, reorg international Facebook page. Um, we do have a final assignment for the people who are going for the badge, but also the ones who are not doing the badge, uh, but are kind of perhaps following along with some of the assignments. Um, the last assignment um, for next week, uh, which says here June 12th, but I think uh, Susan said that we could ha the, the final, final, final deadline for everything to be handed in is June 15th. Um, and it's, it's a very simple assignment this week. Um, basically, we're asking you to think about some of the details about your project, um, so, uh, such as the timeline, um, who you're going to involve, um, and we're also asking you to list just three things that you can do in your space with a minimal, minimal investment. So assuming, you know, that let's say you can't get any funding for your project, what are three things that you can do in your space to improve the conditions with minimal investment? So that's the first part. And then the second part is this really, really short course evaluation um, to help us improve this course if we are going to be um, offering it again. So there's just six uh, short questions that we would like you to answer, and that would be very, very helpful for us in it going forward. So. Um, that's it for me, so I would like to thank everyone for your attention, and uh, we'll be answering questions, I guess, now. Okay, I'm, I'm going to step in here. There's, there's an evaluation link up here that's um, for connecting to Collections Care, so if you could do that, please. And um, in, in the final assignment, there are two things. Um, they're posted in the assignment. Um, when it gets to be maybe next Monday, I'll check the number of assignments. And if I see that there are people that are probably going for a badge but are behind, I'll send you email. And um, thank you, Simon and Lisa and Rachel and Marjo and Jose Luis for doing all this. Is, this is great. Um, I will start the questions now. Lindsay Ogle said, I'm in this, is, but was the building open to the public during this process? Yeah, so um, the, the museum was closed uh, on that day where we did the reorg, and so we didn't have any visitors. Uh, we were actually occupying one of the uh, exhibition, exhibition areas uh, with the map rolling station, and so no, the, building, the museum was closed to the public. OK. Um. I think we went over who the volunteers were, and, but Jenny Harris says, were there other museum people or people from the community that were involved? Uh, other museum people? Uh, well, the volunteers, some of them were, muse were museum people. Uh, some of them were uh, conservators who were, attending, who were attending the AIC conference. Uh, people from the community, I don't believe there were. Um, Lisa, am I correct in assuming that? I think that's right. I, yeah. I, well, there were the movers. Yeah, um, the movers that were part of the project, yeah. So uh, Lindsay Ogles, uh says again 
if you use members from the public, do you have recommendations for training before they come into contact with collections? So Rachel actually said something about this earlier. Um, she says it was also worth mentioning that a good percentage of our group were, were pre sorry were pre program pre program and uh, there was a bonus husband volunteer. So you can do this with smart motivated people and they don't need to be conservators. That's a good point. Um, I would uh, you know everyone that participated in the workshop were were vetted so they they did kind of have to send their CV. Um, so we looked at those before. Uh, just to make sure, you know, we weren't just taking people off the street, and I don't really recommend that either. Um, you know, if you can use volunteers that you're familiar with that work with your institution already, I think that's better than just taking random people from the public, uh, unless you know that they have uh, collections experience. Um, and that's been um, a thing that some um, course participants, some some of our um, some of our participants in Canada here have said that when they involved people uh, like volunteers, uh, new volunteers, uh, they had underestimated the amount of training they would have to do, uh, just object handling mostly, um, because they might not have that sensitivity if they've never worked with a collection. So they did, uh, the, the training piece ended up being a little bit more um, expensive than they had imagined. Uh, and so the, I would just keep that in mind uh, in terms of who you're involving. And mostly the, you know, the training that would be required is mostly uh, sitting down with the team beforehand before you start and, and going over some of the basic principles of object handling. Um, that, that has been useful in some cases. Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, you know, a very theoretical PowerPoint type lecture, but you should have people in your team that already is familiar with some of those principles, like one object, two hands, and all those kinds of things. So um, you know, there, it, what we, how we've done it in the past is just kind of ask the team before we start, so what are some, some of the things that we need to keep in mind before we start when we're handling objects? And then usually all of those things come out from the group. Um, and then if there's things that people have forgotten, then we go, oh, don't forget about this, don't forget about this. You know, all of the uh, health and safety, uh, personal uh, protective equipment, um, also uh, making people aware that it's there. Uh, if there's dust masks, uh, gloves, and all that, like showing them where things are. Um, yeah, um, I think that's... Simon, can I sort of break in here? I, I want everyone to know that you will have access to the... Um, to the education website for a year. And so um, I think Simon's going to be posting some things in the discussion. Um, and if you have questions, you can post them there. I'll keep an eye on them. I'll make sure that pe things get answered if you post them there. And um, uh, just remember to get everything done. Rachel also says the baseline of what we wanted to accomplish could have been done with non-trained volunteers. Uh, she also said you need to do more planning in advance. Um, um, can, I, can I also break Lisa, in? This is Lisa. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. there are, in terms of the question of involving volunteers, there are many, many models for involving volunteers in um, collections-based projects. And um, yes, you can be more efficient and um, organized and come up with even better solutions by having people who have experience. But many institutions who have um, volunteers has, who come on a, a regular basis, like one day a week, or have been involved in other projects, or who are students at a university and maybe taking a class, um, can definitely be involved. If you're doing a reorg project that um, has taken a more significant amount of time in planning, um, than ours did because ours was a case study, um, then you will have time to, to figure out how and where your volunteer core could be effective and helpful. So yeah. that's all I have to say. <laughs>
I, I can see the time is, uh, is up now, so I'd just like to take this uh, moment to thank you, Susan Barger, for uh, helping us uh, coordinate this course. It's been really great working with you. And I'd also like to thank uh, Mike from Learning Times for all the technical support and his patience throughout this process. So <laughs> thank you very much for making this course uh, really easy for us to, uh, to do. <laughs> well, thank you. Um, that's my job. Um, there's a question. Um, then I think we'll quit. Um, people want to have the directions for making the egg mail, uh, the email, cr uh, the egg crate for the umbrellas. So right. I hope you can do that. And yeah. then um, Sagita asked, uh, "How did you raise the wooden storage off the floor to prevent damage from floods?" So the units uh, were directly on the floor. A lot of them had already were already raised from the floor. Um, there wasn't any. There weren't any um, sources of water in that space, and there was not the basement. Basement. There was a sub basement, so we weren't really worried about like large quantities of water uh, accumulating in that space. So for the time being, the storage units were used as they were before, directly on the floor. Um, and uh, any items that ended up being like collection items that 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 were uh, close to the ground were elevated using. Uh, uh, either um, I think FFOM blocks, um, so that's how we dealt with that. Yeah, you can always use uh, um, tin cans. Yep, <laughs> they, they work really well. Um, okay, so I think that we've answered all the questions, and so remember that the final assignment needs to be done by the fifteenth. And that means that you have 12 things. You have to have listened to all the webinars at 6 and done the assignments at 6. Um, probably the beginning of next week, I'll let people know who, are, who look like they're going for a badge, because it looks like we have 40 or 50 people going for a badge. But um, some of you are lacking one thing. I will let you know. And, um, and you have access to the the uh, the course website for a year, so keep that in mind. You won't get a lot of feedback, but it will be there. So thank you, Simon and everyone. Um, we'll sign off for now. And um, that's it. Okay, bye-bye.